Now, keep in mind a lot of times when I do examples, um, you know, they're written to, to, to specifically hit certain points. And, and this one is meant to be a, a starting point for the discussion of object-oriented and developing classes and that sorts of thing. All right? So, I could have done this all in the activity. All right? I could have done this all in the activity, but I didn't. All right? I actually created a second class a meal class, because that's better practice, right? As a general rule, you want to separate what usually is called your business logic. Um, I would think a better term for it would be problem domain logic, because you're not always talking about businesses, right? But separate your business logic from your uh, user interface. Your activity is sort of what's running the show, is running the user interface, all right? Therefore, it shouldn't have your business language code embedded within it. That makes things really tangled. The other notion that is important with object-oriented de development is the notion of encapsulation. And that is that everything about some entity in your problem domain belongs together in a class. All right? The idea of that then is we can pop that class in wherever we need a, a member of that entity and we can do anything with that entity. So, for example here, I have a meal class. All right? Whatever our application that we're developing, we're developing, let's say in this case, a restaurant application. Whatever we were interested in about a meal, sales tax, tip, calories, I don't know, any, anything that you'd be interested in uh, about a meal, we would encapsulate or we would contain in that meal class. Then, anywhere in our application we needed something about a meal, we'd just pop that class in, we'd plug that class in. All right? Essentially what we're doing is we're building a component. We're building a little software component that models some real world entity. All right, and we can then pop that component in anywhere we need that entity and get all the functionality associated with it. Now, why do we do that? Pardon me? Much of it, you want to be able to right. copy code in other programs. Right, be able to use code in other programs. We do it again, as I, as I indicated earlier, for maintainability purposes. Right? So, if the rules for tipping changes and we don't give 15% for average service, we give 17% or something like that, then that change only takes place in one place. We don't have to go and find several different places where um, the calculation occurs. All right? So again, that's, that's why we do it. We're building components. Again, and, and a lot of coding is building and then connecting components together to do to do a job and sometimes you'll create the com uh, components sometimes it's components that are already built in the framework and you're just using them like we're using these android components here and then sometimes you are um, you know creating a component yourself all right so let's look at this and we'll run through the um, the the example uh, source code Package. Again, we define the package that this code is going to appear in, and that would, needs to match what was listed in the manifest. And in this case, my package is edu Lorraine CCC dot CISS 268. So that's the package, that's the bundle that all this code is going to be put into. We have a list of imports here. Does anyone know what the import does? Namespaces is good. Yeah, package is the, probably the Java term, but namespace. If you have code, then you import the, um, the Yeah, 
It makes it easier to use the code. In Java, you have two choices. You can import the package, or you can import the class, or you can write the full name of that class in. So for example, over here, we have our text view, all right, which is in the, in the package Android widget, and we're importing the text view. Because we imported it, we can say text view down here. Because we've said where to find the classes associated with this code. We've said that, hey, if you're looking for a class, here's a class that we're going to be using. So it knows that when I refer to text view, I'm referring to the text view that is in android.widgets or android.widgets. Not someone else's text view. That someone coincidentally named a class called text view. All right? This associated with textbooks, the bookstore, let's say, or whatever. All right? So by putting in that import, we're telling the Java compiler where these classes live. And when I say text view, this is the text view I mean. And then when I do that, when I import it, um, all I have to do is refer to the class name. So all I have to do is say text view. I don't have to say. Otherwise, I could do it. I don't have to import it. But then every time I wanted to refer to a text view, I'd have to give the full name, android.widget.textview. So typically people import um, the classes or packages that they're going to be using. You know, don't think of an import as being like uh, an include file, like in PHP, if any of you have done PHP, where it like, brings, sucks in a section of code, all right? This is simply giving tips to the compiler where to find these classes, which, which of these classes we, uh, we mean and which, which ones we're using. So we have then a set of imports. You can, ins uh, you can import a whole package or you can import just a class from that package, all right? Again, our public class example activity extends activity. What's another name for extends? We see that it extends. What maybe name have you heard in other languages relating to extends? What is that an illustration of? It's an illustration of what's called inheritance. All right? So if I say that Example activity extends activity. It means that the example activity class inherits from the activity class. Another way to say it is activity is the superclass. Example activity is the subclass. Um, sometimes parent-child, they'll say, where the, the superclass is called the parent and the subclass is called the child. All right? But again, the terminology in Java is extends. Can anyone describe when you, why do you inherit things from other things? What, what good does that do us? And when do you do it? When do you inherit one thing from another? Okay. One thing that you do, the, the, the statement was when you're using features from it, and that's true. If, you're, if, if you need to use code, or, or let me rephrase that. One of the, the, when you do inherit one thing from another, you get to use the superclasses code. All right? So you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to um, rewrite the code. All right. So you know, let's think uh, of of an example. Um, there's all kinds of employees here on campus, right? There are full-time employees, part-time employees, student employees. There are full-time faculty. There's there's adjunct faculty. There is office staff and all that. There's certain things though that are true about all employees. You know, 
the calculation of federal withholding tax, for example. All right. Um, other things, you know, amount of vac vacation days that you get. All these things are probably defined for all employees. So if we were creating a set of classes for the employees, we wouldn't want to have to duplicate that code for every kind of employee. If there's some functionality or some code that's shared, or some behavior that's shared among multiple classes, one solution to that is to create an inheritance structure where you have a superclass and you put the common behavior in the superclass and you put the, uh, then, then each subclass can inherit that. Anyone else want to want to take a shot at why we inherit one class from another, or when we inherit one class from another? When they share code, that's, that's a good uh, good point. On a more conceptual level, we inherit one class from another when the subclass is a kind of the main class. All right. So, for example, if we were to have employee and full-time faculty. Full-time faculty is a kind of employee. Right? Is that an accurate statement? Yes, it is. Part-time worker is a kind of employee. That's true as well. Adjunct faculty is a kind of employee. All those things, the is a rule, it's sometimes referred to. A faculty person is an employee. All right. When that is true, then you, you are likely to have an inheritance structure where one thing is a specific kind of a larger class. Another word that's often used for inheritance is specialization. All right. In other words, what is a faculty person? Well, a faculty person is simply a specialized kind of employee. All right? They're still an employee, but there's something special about them. All right? they, do, they do some things that all employees do, but they do some things that are different. All right? And so wherever you see an extends or inherit, it should be the case that the thing that's inheriting from the superclass is a kind of the subclass. All right. Now, what you would not want to do is have an inheritance just because there's some superficial similarities. All right. For example, both students and faculty members get mailings from one community. All right. You get the course schedule or announcements or whatever. Now, you wouldn't want to say, hmm, that code that prints that mailing label out. I'll make student and faculty both inherit from employees. All right? Uh, no, because a student is not an employee. All right? <coughs> Therefore, you would not inherit just to take advantage of some code that coincidentally has to be in two different, for two different kinds of things. So when you're deciding whether to inherit something, you apply the ISA test. If the ISA test is valid, then yeah, okay, you, you, then you make an inheritance. And then you can define code at the level that it occurs. Otherwise, you don't. And there's other ways to, to get around that. We'll probably address those at some point. So in this case, my activity my example activity is a kind of activity. It's this specific activity. You know, activity is a generic term. All right. Mine is this specific activity. Activity is likely an abstract class. I'd have to look it up to know for sure, but it's likely, I would think, an abstract class. What does it mean to say something's an abstract class? Yeah, you don't make an object from it. You don't instantiate that. All right? 
class an object, uh, that's a words that sometimes I even have to bite my tongue and I'll, I'll, I'll mistakenly use one instead of the other. The class is meant to be a template for a kind of entity. An object is a specific instance of that entity. All right? So, you know, student could be a class. And in the student class would be all the attributes and methods that all students share. All right? Each one of you would be then an object because you're a specific student. All right? As opposed to the general student. If you were going to describe your pet, let's say, very few people would say their pet is an animal. All right? Right? And I mean, I guess it's true, probably. But you'd say your pet's a dog, a cat, a bird, a fish, a mouse, whatever. All right? In that example, animal is the abstract class. Yeah, there's things that are true about all animals. But if you have an instance of something, it's not going to just be an instance of animal. It's going to be an instance of something more specific as well. Likewise, no one is just an employee, to extend that example. Everyone would be a faculty member or an administrator or a part-time worker or whatever. All right? um, you know, how did you get to school today? I came on a vehicle. All right, that's probably true, but maybe you rode a bike, or I hope you didn't ride a bike today, but maybe you rode a bike, or a motorcycle, or came on the bus, or came in a car, all right? Activity, I would think, is an abstract class. You, you know, the, what gets created is a specific one, in this case, my specific example activity. Now, if you notice, we have, just like we had in the other example, the onCreate method. And this is what happens when this activity creates. In other words, when I go and run this guy. All right. The first line is typically going to be to call the superclasses onCreate method. All right. Again, there's code in this framework, in the, uh, in the Android framework, that we want to get run to whenever any activity is created. So we call that super to run that code as well. Second thing we do, we set the content view. All right, setting the content view simply means, all right, this is going to be the screen, this is going to be the, the, the GUI associated with this activity. The next line is a little tricky. So we're going to take a look at it and get used to it because you're going to have lines like this in, in all your code. Let's, let's break this down. In fact, let me, let me write it on the board. This is the instance of this template. 
So a button class represents all the buttons that we could ever possibly have. This count button represents this specific button on this specific screen. I represent that button right there. So you'll see a lot of code in Java that will look something like this. Button calc. Oops. And that's simply defining a variable that is going to contain an object of class button. All right. If I define a variable like this, I'm simply telling Java what is going to be in this variable. That this variable calc is going to hold a button. I have not created a button object yet. Alright? So, this part of the statement simply says I have a variable called calc and it's going to hold a button. Alright? Where am I getting the button from? All right. I'm getting the button from the screen. All right. From the screen that's being displayed. Why do I need to do this? Because I need to write some code about that button. Remember we talked about why does the button have an ID and that text string does it? That text string, we don't have to write any code for that. So we don't even need to put an ID. We don't have to, to, to address that. But this button we do have to address because we have to write some code. What kind of code do we have to write? We have to write the code about what happens when that button gets pressed. All right? We have to handle what happens when that button gets pressed. All right? So therefore, we need to point to that button so that we can write that code that says what happens when the button gets pressed. But first, we have to point to that button and say, this is the button that I want to write code for. Because my application could have a bunch of buttons on it. Right? And I have to be able to say, when this button's pressed, I want to do this. When this button's pressed, I want to do that. So, I'm saying I have a variable called count that's going to contain a button. What button is it going to contain? I'm going to find on my view. Alright. And what is our view? Well, it is the screen that was created when we said set content view of that activity. All right. In other words, that XML file is brought in and is sort of inflated, is brought to life. So that XML file gets expanded into an actual screen with actual button objects and actual text box objects and so on. And we're now asking, hey, on your view, on your screen, Mr. Activity, Find the thing that has this ID. So that's why we need an ID for it. Because we need to be able to point to that and say, specifically, this is what I want to write code for. I want to write code for this button. All right? Just to check, mm -hmm. the R stands for resource. Resource. So ID, ID. Is the ID. And the count. Is the yeah. If you notice in the string file for this guy, it probably had something like app id calc or, or app plus id calc if you if you notice that. That's saying, hey, create an ID for this called calc. And then it will it will find it. Now, let me check on the time here. Okay, good. What does this button do? What does this button in parentheses do at the beginning? Doesn't display the button. Not yet. No. No, it, the button got displayed in the second line of code that said set content view. That displayed the button. The layout. Okay. Yeah, that displayed the layout. We know that calc, the thing that has an idea of calc is a button. We know that because we wrote the program, right? Alright, we put that ID in. So we know that that's a button. But the Java compiler doesn't know that. That thing, we're finding, find view by ID, we're, we, we're looking at any control on there. We're going to do the same thing for text boxes. We're going to 
find a text box. We're going to do that for spinner controls. We're going to find a spinner. All right? So this find view by ID might point to any kind of view on our layout. Not just a button. It could be anything. We have to tell the compiler, hey, that thing that you find is going to be a button. Therefore, treat it like a button. All right? Again, the inheritance structure for this will look something like this. I might not be precisely right. But there is view. And inherited from the view is button, spinner, image view, and so on. All right? When we call this function, find view by ID, it might return any of these views. It's going to simply return some sort of view. All right? Now, we don't do the same thing to each of these views, right? You click a button. All right? You don't necessarily click an image view. Nothing necessarily happens when you click it. Or there's different behaviors associated with these things. So we want to be able to treat this button like a button. And yet, if all the Java compiler knows it as is a view, which is all this is going to tell it, all this tells it is, hey, here's this. You asked for the view. Here it is. Here's your view. We have to tell the Java compiler, hey, that view is a button. And then we can treat it like a button. And we can code all the things that are associated with the button that aren't associated with the regular view. So, to sort of break this down and put it back together, what this does is this declares a variable called calc in which we're going to store a button. The specific calc button is going to correspond to the button or the view on the page, on our screen, that has this as an ID. And it is in fact a button, therefore we can treat it like a button. So that's essentially in a nutshell what that line of code means. You'll notice later on we're going to do that to the other controls that we want to write some code for. We're going to find them on the screen, and we're going to tell the Java compiler to treat it like a text view or treat it like an, an input uh, control or so on, edit text. The word button in parentheses, where I said treat it like a button, the, the proper term for that is casting. I'm casting that view as a button. So that's what I'm doing here. So let, let's rewind a little bit. All right. This gets called. This creates my view for this activity using this, whoops, using this as a layout. And here, yep. The ID of that button, we create the ID called calc. So, that button object is out there, right? But, this code needs a reference to it, all right? So we have to find it and point to it. And that's what this line of code does finds on the view the thing that has that as an ID, let's treat it like a button, and store it in our variable called calc. All right. I'm going to quickly go through the remaining portion of